You're listening to the Boxing Breakdown Report with resident wager talk handicapper Kevin Dolan. Get all your latest pro boxing tips at the Sports Wolf 83 on Twitter. What's happening, boxing betters? Welcome into another edition of the Boxing Breakdown Report with me, your host, Kevin Dolan, where each and every week we'll give our thoughts on that weekend's most high-profile fights and, more importantly, the best value bets we made in each one. So let's get into it. Obviously, we're going to start this edition with the recap from last week. Uh, like, what an amazing fight. Absolutely amazing fight between Sean Porter and Errol Spence. Uh, they put on quite a show. It was a back-and-forth affair. I think Porter dominated early, and then obviously Errol Spence came on late. Not that late, you know, around 6-7, to seven, he started with the body attack, and Porter seemed to be feeling the effects from round 8 or round 9 on. A very close fight, hard fight to score. I have no problem personally with the decision. I know that it was on Twitter afterwards, and there was a lot of robbery calls. Uh, for Obviously, people on both sides, people were like, it should have been wider for Errol Spence, especially with the knockdown. But there's a lot of Sean Porter supporters out there too who feel that their man won. As I said, I have no particular strong opinion on it. I thought the I thought the uh, the Porter card was acceptable to me. The one judge who had it scored for Porter, and um, because frankly there were so many swing rounds in it, I scored it for Spence. But obviously, when you're betting on a fight, you're you're, you're not totally impartial, and uh, I felt like we were going to cash, especially in round eleven, when Errol Spence clipped him with that beautiful left uh, hook to the jaw. But Porter, man, he is one tough guy. So congrats to anyone who took Spence on decision. Um, close, close, close fight to score. And, you know, Terence Crawford's obviously going to be licking his lips saying that Spence performance. I was actually very surprised. I thought Spence would be able to deal with Porter more easily. Just because we've seen Kel Brook do it, you know. Kel Brook would allow Sean Porter to run onto his shoulder. He'd counter him with the right hand. And then he'd turn him and kept making Porter reset uh, to go in for another attack. Errol Spence wasn't doing that. He, he simply looked befuddled at the start of the fight. He was only moving in lateral, like straight lines back and forth. Uh, he seemed unable to turn Sean Porter. I have to say, that was one of the best Sean Porters I've seen. Especially coming out after the Ugas fight. But even with that, Spence made it hard work. And the worrying thing for Spence is... It was actually Porter's changing of style in around the 6th or 7th round. Now, I don't know whether it was because Porter was getting more tired, but he started to stay in the pocket longer. And that obviously favoured Spence. Spence, the better inside fighter of the two. And Spence was hitting him with that body attack, slowed him down. Now, the other point I'll say to this is Spence was low-blowing him throughout. I'm not picking sides on this. I'm just saying what I saw. And, you know, Jack Reese failed as a referee, in my opinion. Um, Kenny Porter told him at one point during the fight look Errol Spence is low, low balling and you know Jack Reese simply said oh Sean Porter's shorts are too high now th- there was literally dozens of times during that fight where he low balled him so you know I, I definitely think you know these soft warnings weren't enough he should have been deducted a point at least even up kind of the knockdown, but as I said, I had no real, I had no real problems with the decision. I thought the decision was fair enough. I think Spence did enough to win the fight. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, with the with the talk of a Terence Crawford fight, talk of potentially Manny Pacquiao fight. Obviously, we've seen Danny Garcia come into the ring after, you know, and uh, each of those fights presents its own problem for Errol Spence moving forward. Um, Danny Garcia's got that cracking left hook. If that catches Errol Spence, could be trouble. Uh, I think Manny Pacquiao is obviously just a little bit over the hill, but make no mistake, if it was the Manny Pacquiao of 2010, 2011, the guy who was beating up Joshua Clotty, the boy, the, the boy who was taking care of Antonio Margarito, if that was Pacquiao then, if this was the guy now, I'd, I'd, I'd put the bank on Pacquiao to beat Errol Spence. Um, I was, as I say, I was surprised that Errol Spence found it so hard to uh, to turn Sean Porter. And effectively do what Kel Brook did to him. So, yeah, a bit surprised by that. And, um, and yeah, definitely, obviously, going to make Terence Crawford a slight favourite after what we saw on Saturday night. But, yeah, take nothing away from Porter. Fantastic performance. One tough dude. And uh, and congrats to anybody who took the points decision. 
in the other fights, um, you know, Daniel Dubois got the first round KO. Uh, not particularly surprising there. And in the other fights, we've seen Benavides stop Anthony Darrell with a really bad cut. Um, but Darrell did well in the fight. You know, he, he put up a decent performance, but in the end, it wasn't good enough. So let's move on to this week's fight. Obviously, the biggest fight in the card this week is Golovkin versus Devorachenko. Odds are going off Golovkin minus 450, Devorachenko plus 330. That seems to be the consensus. Now, this fight's for the vacant IBF title. Uh, there's a, a long, <laughs> for anyone interested, you can look look this up. Uh, there's a long history with this IBF. IBF are very quick to uh, to strip fighters of their belt. So Golovkin used to have this belt. He got stripped. It went to Canelo. He got stripped. So uh, yeah, you know this is this is the fight for the vacant IBF title. Um, let's get into it. Obviously, Golovkin's the name in this fight. Signed a big contract with the Zone. Uh, the zone obviously being the, the the money machine that they are, they wanted to see Triple G versus Canelo three. That fight didn't make it, so this is a kind of standing fight. But obviously they want to see it next year, so we're going to look at that in the in the future. But right now, uh, Golovkin's coming off the Steve Rolls fight. Now Steve Rolls, uh, not a named fighter, comes out of Toronto, I believe, and Steve Rolls was hitting him so. We kind of hear this about Golovkin every time he fights. We heard it against Kel Brook. We heard it against uh, Vanis Matarosian. Oh, he's being caught. The age is catching up to him. Because uh, Rose was catching him early. I think Rose caught him early in the first two rounds. And there was one particularly nice shot he caught him with. So, you know, people are very quick. They go, oh, that's it. Triple G's finished. You know, the writing's on the wall. He's on the downhill slope. I- I've watched the fight a couple of times. I haven't seen what most people see. I... Triple G to me looks the same Triple G's always been. His a lot of his offense offense is uh, based on you know sometimes allowing fighters to hit him. He did that against Willie Monroe in the in the in the mid rounds. So when he fought Willie Monroe a couple of years ago, he dominated early, put Monroe down a few times. Then Monroe, who's an excellent mover, got really good legs. Monroe was circling him, keeping out of the danger zone, and it's almost like he'll allow Monroe to hit him, bring him into that bear trap. And then he finished him off. And that's exactly what happened. Did the same to Kell Brook. Um, and he's, he's done the same throughout. If he doesn't respect your power, he'll allow you to come inside. It's it's more efficient for him to finish you in the long term, to bring you inside to where he wants you. And then he starts unloading. And especially with some of his punch selection, it, like he can really do some damage. So I just felt in the Steve Rose fight, it was just more of the same from Golovkin. It wasn't as if Steve Rose was out boxing him in any regard. It was just more I felt that, you know, oh, look, let's let's bring him into the danger zone, put on a show for the fans. And, then he, I mean, he finished him brutally. So, you know, I, I don't see any particular... And, it, you know, the other thing, people are going, oh, maybe his speed has gone... Golovkin's a fighter who never relied on speed. You know, he's not a fast guy. Even again in the fight with Kell Brook, he had to run across the ring to get at Brook. He's not a particularly fast fighter. Now, the other point to make about the recent Golovkin fight was that it was his first fight under Jonathan Banks, his new trainer. Now, Jonathan Banks worked under Emmanuel Stewart. He took over as Vladimir Klitschko's trainer for a while. And I've seen some good improvements from Golovkin. So it wasn't all doom and gloom by any stretch. Um, He got up on his toes over the first couple of rounds. I like that. I'm glad he's got back to that instead of this flat-footed, come-forward approach. And the more positive scene, at least for me, was in terms of the body attack. This is something he lacked, I felt, in the Canelo fights. You know, and I'm sure I'm going to get people in the comments. But, uh, I, I like, I have Golovkin 2-0 and against Canelo. I thought he won both fights. The first one, clearly, the second fight was close. I think I believe I had it 115-113. Nonetheless, I think he won the second fight off his jab. But regardless of how you feel about those two fights, um, Golovkin didn't really utilize the body attack. You could also argue maybe he didn't want to utilize the body attack because going to the body would have left him exposed upstairs. Regardless of all that, his body attacks kind of back. He broke down rolls with some really nice body shots. So I'm glad kind of Jonathan Banks is bringing that in. I don't really, I'm not going to slag anyone off on this podcast, but I don't really rate Abel Sanchez as a, tra- as a trainer. Uh, for, like There's numerous occasions with this when Gassier fought Uzik last year. 
it was the same game plan for full 12 rounds. Gassiev was get, being like beaten up. It was almost embarrassing. Every time he go back to the corner, uh, all Abel Sanchez was doing was threatening him with, I'm going to stop this fight, I'm going to stop this fight, show me something, I'm going to stop this fight. There was no instruction. There was no, like, how, how, how can I you know, do this, do that, you know, counter him on the left. There was none of that. It was just like, if you don't show me something, try harder. That's, that's not what you want out of a top-tier trainer. So I actually think Golovkin moving away from Abel Sanchez is good. I think it's it's a breath of fresh air. And especially if he keeps on, on his feet and utilizes the body attack, uh, it could be a better Triple G, as scary as that sounds. It could be a better Triple G moving forward. Now, of course, at the end of the day, he's still 37. He's not getting any younger. His reflexes are dimming. But Golovkin never relied on reflexes, never relied on speed. So, as I said, I, from what i see in the rules fight, I, I'm not spelling the doom button on Golovkin quite yet. I still think, and let, until he, until I see something in the ring that says he's not the same guy as he was before, I, I see no problem with Golovkin. Now, he faces a guy, Endeavor Achango, very, very good fighter, Ukrainian fighter. I mean, you know the pedigree coming out of Ukraine right now with, you know, pound for pound is coming out of the rear probably the number one boxing country on the planet you know you got Gvozdik Uzik Lovachenko so he's from that breed and in his last fight he had a tough fight against a guy Kolke who's very hard to look good against now Kolke you know he's fought Andrade like out of, based out of Germany he's not German I think he's South American but based out of Germany and he is a very very tricky fighter not a big name so a lot of people don't want to fight him um, Devra Chango came out of that but it was a very very close fight and then obviously before that he fought Jacobs Daniel Jacobs so uh, Daniel Jacobs gave Glovkin one hell of a fight so uh, you know he's got that pedigree and some people say he beat Jacobs now Jacobs caught him in the first round uh, put him down it looked as though it was going to be an early night's work but uh, Devra Chango's nickname is the technician and it's well earned because he you know he adapted after the lockdown got back in the fight and as I said, a lot of people, some, a lot of people on Twitter had him winning. Uh, a lot of people on the boxing forums had him winning. So uh, I personally, I think I had it scored to Danny Jacobs. I don't remember exactly like what I scored the fight, but I had it scored for Danny Jacobs. So uh, you know, Devereyevchenko is definitely going to pose a threat. Now these two were meant to fight this time last year. That's why Golovkin got stripped. So you know, this fight's been in the making for a while. I'm sure Golov, I'm sure both fighters have prepared adequately for each other. But the big question mark on this fight is mainly all about is Golovkin still Golovkin? If Golovkin's still Golovkin, this is uh, this. Sh- yes, Devereyevchenko is a good fighter, but he's not at Golovkin's level. So basically, when you look at the odds for this fight, the minus four fifty on Golovkin, the plus three thirty on Devereyevchenko, you're basing that off. Is Golovkin still Golovkin? Now, I believe he is. And the the breakdown for this fight, the analysis is it again. It comes down to you know Triple G. The only time he's been tested in fights is when he respects someone's power. If he doesn't respect your power, the fight's over. The fight's over. So you know Canelo presented him huge problems, especially in the second fight, um, because Canelo cracks. Daniel Jacobs also cracks. You know we seen him absolutely batter Peter Quillen in the first round. So uh, he he's got some bang. Um, and even when Golovkin fought David Lemieux, you know, he, he, he wasn't going in there looking to trade with David Lemieux because David Lemieux is one of the hardest punchers in the middleweight division. He slowly broke him down from the outside with the jab and then came in for the kill later on around round eight. So, you know, Triple G only suffers problems with people, with fighters with power. Now, Devereyevchenko has a kind of misleading KO ratio of 71%. Uh... I think it's misleading in the fact that most of that KO ratio was built up against less than elite fighters. Uh, A lot of journeymen so far, Endeavor Achenko. He's really only stepped up in his last two fights. So somewhat misleading. You might look at 71% and go, wow, this guy can crack. Now, don't get me wrong. I think Endeavor Achenko, you know, he can definitely keep you honest. But I don't think he's got anywhere near enough power to stop Triple G in this fight. You know, if Triple G can take a straight left hook from Canelo... I can't see Devereyevchenko troubling him. It's more of the fact, can Devereyevchenko do enough to keep Golovkin from jogging Orton forward and finishing him? That is the question in this fight. Um, I favour in this, this won't be a, a bet, as, you know, in, in terms of my own money, but 
I definitely lean Triple G by points. Uh, the reason it's not a bet is simply because I could see Triple G finishing him late. I'm not willing to lay minus 450. I think the fight is actually priced perfectly by the bookmakers. It leaves that question mark up on whether, whether Triple G is is the real Triple G or not. Um, you're getting good good odds on the points decision. Points decision for Triple G is plus 140. I think that is slightly the most likely scenario in this. Devorachenko is a tricky customer. Again, nickname called a technician. There's a reason for that. He's very good at adapting. He's better, much better on his feet than Triple G is. So I think he can. Ad- I think he can do enough to see out the twelve rounds. I don't see a Devorachenko decision here. And we'll also say, look, in- in- unless you're blind, boxing politics, you have to handicap boxing politics. You, s- you simply have to. When you when you match up two fighters, you may go, well, Devorachenko. It's not. It, you know, it, the odds are a bit wide. But when you factor in the politics in terms of, you know, the zone gave Triple G a big contract. The zone gave Canelo a big contract. They want the trilogy fight. Uh, you know, that's the fight that they want. Every available advantage is going to be in Triple G's camp on this. He's the bigger name than Devorachenko for obvious reasons. And, you know, even if you look at last week's fight, look, Anthony Durrell's cut was bad. But was it any worse than Tyson Fury's cut a couple of weeks before? You know, that's that, that's debatable. It was a bad cut, but probably not as bad as Tyson Fury's. One fighter gets stopped. One fighter's allowed to continue. You get the feeling, obviously, if Tyson Fury was the challenger in that fight, the fight would have been stopped. And, you know, Otto Wallen's hand would have got raised in that fight. So, you know, obviously there's nothing you can do if you come in and knock a guy out or dominate him in the, in the thing. But if it's a close fight, you're going to get every, you know, available decision. You're going to get the bias. So... I think that factor plays into this fight a little bit. So that's why I wouldn't bet on Devorachenko. I don't think he can do enough to dominate. I definitely don't think he can do enough to stop Triple G. Um, could be proven wrong in this fight, but I just don't see it. So I would lean Golovkin points decision. Plus 140 you can get on that. That would be my bet if I had to make one. Um, but again, it's not a premium selection because I could see Golovkin stopping him late. And, uh, and hopefully you know we get to see that single to my old trilogy fight um possibly a fight i'll be at myself um and the, and the last thing before we finish off is uh, keep an eye on the undercard for madramov israel madramov i like this fighter i mean he's going off at minus 4100 the only reason i'm bringing him up is because he's three and oh but this keep your eyes on this fighter because i can see this fighter go- i i'd actually prefer to see madramov versus triple z to be honest uh he's a 154 pounder and uh, yeah, he looks, he looks, he looks the good. So if you're watching that, keep an eye on the undercard. Um, that should wrap things up for this edition of the Boxing Breakdown Report. Uh, leave your comments in the section below. I enjoyed last week's comments uh, on that fight. I always want to know what you think. And uh, tell me what I got wrong. Tell me what I got right. And as always, you can follow me over on Twitter at the Sports Wolf 83 or at wagertalk.com. Slana Walyang, till next time. Peace out.